I don't need that. that. Hi, guys. You can hear me good? You don't mind I brought a little ambiance? You good with that? <laughs> Calms me down. So first of all, thank you so much. I just want to start by um, saying first a big thank you to Jeff and Michelle for trusting me with you guys, because that's a huge honor. I think about the fact that um, I know Jeff and Michelle, you're just you personally mean so much to them, every one of you. You have no idea. You have no idea, and I know your spiritual growth is really important to Jeff, too. I think about a year, it's 365 days, right? And how many Sundays are there? There's 52 Sundays, and we meet for an hour, so that's 52 hours, which is what? If you added it up in days, that's like two days and four hours or something like that, and that's how much time Jeff has to share this amazing, the simplicity of the good news with you, and he entrusted one of those hours to me. So Jeff, thank you, and I don't take it lightly, and I'm, I will tell you right up front, I am s extremely nervous, watch. Okay. <laughs> That's my safety net, right there. So if you could put me there, I do so, so, so much better. Um, but I'm gonna just share something with you. I hope you're not looking for a theological message for those of you that are tuning in online. If this is your first time, I beg you to please come back because this will not be a full representation <laughs> or even a partial representation of what Freedom Life Center is all about. Um, and you really need to hear our pastor. He's amazing and I'm so grateful for him. And I know you guys share that, right? You share that, come on. I know, we all share that. We're so grateful for Jeff. So this is not comfortable for me. I am more of a worshiper than a theologian, so I am not even gonna attempt to be a theologian. You guys cool with that? Okay, good, because that's not, that would be lying, and I'm not that. <laughs> uh, so today I'm just gonna share a little bit of a perspective with you. And um, I thought about what should I, you know, Jeff asked me to do this, and I'll be honest with you, the reason I said yes is because several months back, I remember Jeff, he asked Pete to speak, and Carl to speak, I mean, when Jeff wants to go away, but other than that, it's kind of hard for him. I, my heart goes out to him because who do you ask, right? And so I think out of me feeling sorry for Jeff, I said to him, I would be willing to do that to help you. Dang, put your foot in your mouth, because then he called me two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, but anyway, but I was thinking about this time of year with Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving's right around the corner, some kind of Thanksgiving. And I thought about, I'm going to take a, a little bit of perspective on gratitude. You guys okay if I do that? So Lydia, there's probably a slide there that's, oh, look what my daughter did. You are so creative, Bean. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Um, but I was going to talk about an attitude of gratitude. So I looked up what is an attitude, and I know that's a platitude all in itself, right? You've heard that a million times, but I wanted to take it just a little bit deeper. An attitude, I love the, the definition of it. Is that up there? Yeah. It's a settled way of thinking or feeling about something or something, somebody. Typically a way that's reflected in your behavior, and that was the key for me. I liked that, I liked that it's a way, right? Jeff talks about even Christianity as the way, and it changes your behavior, so it's like an attitude, and I like that, so I thought, okay, let's take it now further. What does gratitude mean? And gratitude is a warm feeling of thankfulness and a ready to show appreciation towards someone specific and being thankful for what you have or what you've been given. And I liked this one, this was in Webster's, and it says, and not constantly seeking more, right? Because then that gets into the area of, of entitlement and expectation, and that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about flat out gratitude, being thankful for something. So I thought I'd go into a couple really quick stories, just bear with me here in the Bible on gratitude. There's so many, oh my gosh, there's like, when I started looking, I thought, I just want some, a couple good examples of gratitude in the Bible. So I'm just going to pick four real fast. This is not the meat of what I want to share with you, but it does set, set us up a little bit. And I was thinking about Mary, okay, and Mary's song. You've all heard of Mary's song. So here's Mary, right? You got her picture up there? There she is. She's like just a kid. She's like somewhere they estimate between 12 and 14 years old. So let's say she's 13 years old, right? And some knocking on her door. This big angel comes in and says, Mary, don't be afraid you found favor with God. Okay, 13 years old, that guy comes knocking at your door, going, <laughs> I'm under the bed, because I'm like, oh my goodness, what is happening? I don't want any part of this, right? And so she, he continues, he says, don't be afraid, and he tells her that the plan God has for her to literally change the world, 
right? Isn't that so cool? 13 years old. I thought I was a unicorn when I was 13 years old. So I'm not kidding. And here's Mary's response, right? My response at 13 would have been terror or not only this, think about her state, right? She's engaged to somebody. Now she's told she's going to be impregnated with the savior of the world, right? How do you explain that to mom, to neighbors, the church, your fiance, right? All this stuff, she could have been stoned to death. This was really life altering, but not only that, this endangered her life. I would have been terrified. I probably, in my weakness and fear, would have said, heck no, please go find somebody else, right? But here's what Mary said. Here's Mary's song. It's from Luke 1, 26, 38. Did I give you that slide? Here's how she responded. I love this. It said, oh, how I praise the Lord. Not my first words. <laughs> how I rejoice in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant, and now generation after generation forever shall call me blessed of God, for he, the mighty Holy One, has done great things to me. His mercy goes on from generation to generation to all who receive him. Isn't that beautiful? So she chose gratitude. Not saying that would have been my first choice. Mine would have been terror. So let's go to another story. So another story of gratitude in the Bible is Hannah. I love this story. Hannah Panini, you guys all know the story, right? I'll just give you a little bit of a recap of it. Um, the backstory is in, if you want to look it up, it's in 1 Samuel. Um, it's like all of chapter 1. And it's the story of Elkanah, right, who's the guy. And he has two wives, Hannah and Panina. And Panina had some children, but Hannah didn't. And to be quite honest, Panina was such a <clears throat> about it. She was, let's basically say it, she was a snot, and she held it over Hannah. Because in those days, if you had children and bare sons, of course, that elevates your status as a woman. But um, if you didn't, if you only had girls, that, that lowered you down the peg. But if you had none, that made it even worse, right? So here's poor Hannah. But Elkanah loved Hannah. He loved her. The scripture says each year Elkanah and his family would go to the tabernacle in Shiloh to worship the Lord and to make sacrifices. On the day that they present the sacrifice, Elkanah would celebrate the happy occasion by giving gifts to Penina and her children. But although he loved Hannah very much, key right there, he could give her only one present for herself, for the Lord had sealed her womb so she had no children to give presents to. And Penina made matters way worse by taunting her. You know how those mean girls is like an episode right out of Mean Girls. Taunting Hannah because of her barrenness. And every year it was the same. And Penina was scoffing and laughing at her as they would go to Shiloh, and she would make her cry so bad that she wouldn't eat. So Elkanah said, what's the matter? Why aren't you eating? Why make such a fuss over having no children? Isn't having me better than 10 sons? No male pride there, but, um, but on, so one evening after they were at Shiloh, Hannah went over to the tabernacle and the priest sits by the door, right? So Eli is this priest, he's sitting at the door. Hannah go, goes in and she is pouring her heart out to God so much, begging him, Father, please open my womb. You know, all these people are scoffing at me, making a ridicule of me. Please open my womb. Give me the child. And she says, if you will look down upon my sorrows and answer my prayers, give me a son, I will give him straight back to you. And he'll be yours for his entire life, and his hair shall never be cut. So it was a promise she made to God. So Eli sees this. He's looking over here. He sees this woman, blah, 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 blah. You know, she's doing her thing. He thinks what? She's drunk right? It's probably like, yo, woman, out of the holy house. You're drunk. Get out of here. And she says, no, 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 I'm not drunk. I'm just so sad, and I've been pouring out my heart. Please don't think that I'm some drunken bum. And so Eli says, in that case, cheer up, because may the Lord of Israel grant you your petition, whatever it is. Oh, thank you, sir, the man of God. Just prayed a blessing on her. She took that soda heart. She ran home. She went back. She was eating her meals again. And then lo and behold, within the proper time, which I would assume was about nine months or so, the Lord remembered her petition. And in the process, a baby boy was born to her. And that was Samuel, which means asked of God because she said, I asked the Lord for him. So what did she do? Did she forget? 
Did she forget her promise? No, she was so grateful. She fulfilled her promise to God. She gave Samuel to the church, to God. She offered his life up. And I love this, this is her prayer. If you have that there, Lydia, look how pretty she is. How I rejoice in the Lord, how he has blessed me. Now I have an answer for my enemies, for the Lord has solved my problems. How I rejoice, no one is as holy as the Lord. There is no other God, nor any rock like my God. That's from 1 Samuel 2. So she chose gratitude, and she never forgot. Another quick story. This is one of my favorites. Don't show this picture yet, Lid, okay? I'll tell you when to show this picture. So this one's about King David. Okay, so King David had been petitioning. He wants that Ark of the Covenant. That's like the Super Bowl trophy, right? It's like the Lombardi trophy. Wants to bring it back to his city, and um, they have the Ark of the Covenant, and they want to bring it back. This is all in Samuel, um, 2 Samuel 6. So David mobilized this army of 30,000 dudes, right? All these troops to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which was meant, supposed to carry the presence of God. It had things like the Ten Commandments in there, the Ark of the Covenant. You can read all that. I'm not teaching on that. But anyway, um, it says, the Ark was placed upon a cart and taken from the hillside of Abinadab and was driven by Abinadab's sons, Uzzah and Ahio. Ahio walked in the front and was followed by David and the other leaders of Israel who were joyously waving branches of juniper trees and playing all sorts of musical instruments, cymbals, castanets, all that stuff, big parade. Seriously, like the Super Bowl parade. You know how when the team wins and they come back to town and everybody goes to Pittsburgh and has a big hoopla? It was like that, right? So excited, the Ark of the Covenant's coming. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, right, one of the oxen stumbled and Uzzah, one of the sons of Abinadab, put his hand on, you're not supposed to touch it, Okay. He put his hand on it, on the Ark of the Covenant, and he steadied the Ark, and the, it says the anger of the Lord, that was what they thought, the anger of the Lord flared out against Uzzah and killed him instantly for doing their, this, and he died beside the Ark. And David was so mad at God at what he had done, so he named that spot the place of wrath upon Uzzah, and it's still called that today. So now David's afraid. They're not all the way back to the city yet, and he's like, how can I bring this ark home? This guy just dropped dead at the side. There's his ashes right there, right? How can I bring it home? So he decided, instead of taking it to the city of David, that they would carry it to this house of this guy named Obed Obadon, and who had come from Gath, and it remained in this dude's house for three months. And in those three months, this guy's household was so blessed, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant is there. When David heard about all the blessings this guy was having, he thought, man, I have got to just pull up my bootstraps, suck it up, don't be afraid. We have got to get this Ark of the Covenant to the city of David, right? So he got, gets the Ark, gets some new guys, right? They're brave enough to do it, and they take the Ark. They probably got some really steady oxen, and they could come in t- with a great celebration. They would go like six paces and make an offering. Six paces, make an offering. It was crazy what they would do. And here's it says in the scriptures, it says, and David, you can show that picture now, Lydia. It says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and he was wearing priest clothing or an ephod, which in our day would be like your underwear, okay? So Israel brought home the ark of the Lord with so much shouting and blowing of trumpets. It was like the, um, like the women's U.S. soccer team for the, remember that? When that girl, when they won gold medal in the Olympics and that girl whips off her shirt. She was so excited and so grateful. That was David. He's like, oh my gosh, here comes. And he's in his underwear, right? So the ark was, um, as it came into the city, Michal, which is Saul's daughter, she was watching from her window and she sees David marching around in his underwear and she couldn't stand it. She was so embarrassed. Anybody in your family ever embarrass you? That's how she felt. She felt but 10 times worse because it was way bigger then. So the ark was placed inside the tent that David prepared for it. And he sacrificed offerings and thanks before the Lord and blessed people in the name of the Lord and gave presents to everyone. He gave everybody a loaf of bread, some wine, a cake of raisins. I don't know why, but he did. So anyway, when it was all over and everybody went home, he went to, to go bless his own family, but Michal came out to meet him, and she says with like all oh, this great contempt and disgust, look how glorious the king of Israel looked today. She says, you exposed yourself to the girls on the street like a common pervert. 
And David retorted, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above even your dad, Saul and his family, and who appointed me as leader of Israel and the people of the Lord. So I am willing to act like a fool in order to show my joy in my Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, but I will be respected by those girls of whom you spoke. And to her dying day, Michal, the daughter of Saul, was humbled before God and, didn't ne and never bore a child. Therefore, there was no descendant of Saul to ever regain the throne of Israel. So I love that story of gratitude. He was so grateful. He, like that girl, whipped off his shirt and was so fired up. The Ark of the Covenant is home here in the city of David where it belongs. So that's how he responded in his gratitude. He was willing to make a complete and total fool of himself because of his gratitude. And the last story I want to share with you is Jesus and the 10 lepers. As they continue to Jerusalem, I don't know if I put this, um, there he is, Jesus. As they continued on towards Jerusalem, they reached the border between Gal Galilee and Samaria, and as they entered a village there, 10 lepers stood in a distance crying out, Jesus, sir, have mercy on us. Now remember lepers, they had to keep a major distance and just continually shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. Couldn't do anything, couldn't have a normal life, had to live separate, couldn't go to temple. All the things that like made your life a life they had no part of, right? So Jesus, of course, had mercy on them. And he says, go to, I love this part. He says, go to the Jewish priests and show them, that, show them that you are healed. And as they were going, their leprosy disappeared. So he didn't go, your leprosy is all gone, now go show them. He didn't. They're still covered with lesions and sores. And he says, go tell them you're healed. And they're probably going, but I still got this, you know, my fingers are on the ground, and you know, and, um, but he says, no, go, and you'll be healed, and he did, and I love that about Jesus, in all the miracles, he always asks us to do something very natural, very simplistic, like water into wine, go fill that with water, very simple, able to do that, right, and then he does his great, great miracles, but anyway, one of them came back to Jesus, shouting, glory to God, I am healed, I am healed, and he fell flat on the ground at Jesus' feet, face downward, thanking him, and this guy was a despised Samaritan. You, we've learned from Jeff many times, the Samaritans were the worst of the worst of the worst, in, as far as these people were concerned. They were the lowest of low for this one out of all those 10 lepers, only one came back with a heart of gratitude and praising, right? His response was praising and believing. He believed before his sores were even healed because when he did that, then Jesus said, stand and go because now your faith has made you well. So those are just his response with gratitude was to praise Jesus, right? Came right to him and fell at his feet, started praising him. So you see several different responses to that. And there's so many more. I mean, we could think about, Oh, Sarah and Abraham, right? Blessed with Isaac. Old folks, you know, laughing like, really, you're gonna I'm in my 80s and I'm gonna have a baby? Abraham was what? I don't even remember how old he was. How about when Martha realized that Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? Think she was a little grateful then? How about Job when he was healed and his whole family was restored, not just once over, but tenfold? How about the cripple at the gate? Beautiful, I love that story. And he went home leaping and praising and people thought he was crazy, even his own family. I just love those stories of gratitude. Um, so, but it's easy to give thanks when we receive an unexpected blessing or a promotion, like Mary did, right? She got this unexpected blessing. It's easy to give praise in that. How about when you get an answer to prayer, like Hannah and like Sarah and, and Abraham? When you get that answer to prayer, it's easy to give thanks. How about when you receive a financial blessing or win the blessing lottery, like David did with the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's easy to give thanks for that. How about when you receive a healing, like the lepers and like the cripple at Gate Beautiful? How about when you witness a miracle, like Martha, when Lazarus rose from the dead? Easy to give, give thanks and be grateful then, right? But what about not so great times? Okay, so I was thinking about our time now, 2020, weird year, right? Weird, yeah, totally weird. Weird timing pandemic, isolation, quarantine, Fear, depression are running rampant. At the center where I work, abuse is so, it's five times what it normally is. Usually we see five patients a month. We're getting five to seven a week, abuse victims. 
It's just incredible what the pandemic has done. The presidential election, people have literally lost their minds and, and it's caused scandals, corruption, lying, like blatant lying. This idealistic duality, like you cannot disagree with me, the cancer culture, or I'll kill you. What is that, right? That's America, right? Division, riots, cities burning to the ground, looting, intolerance. How about censorship? You can't say what you want on Facebook and Twitter anymore? I thought this was America. Chaos, hatred. I've never seen hatred so on the rise, right? Financial uncertainty, people wondering where the next paycheck's coming from. Interesting year. Can we give thanks in that? First Thessalonians 5.18. Paul gives this letter to this new church, Thessalonica, right? He's there, he leaves, he's worried about it. He's like, man, they're so new, and I don't want anybody, they're being persecuted, I don't want anybody giving them wrong teaching. So he writes this letter to them, and Thessalonica, that's modern day Greece, isn't it, Jeff? I think it's modern day Greece. And that, that scripture says, give thanks in all circumstances. That's what Paul wanted to tell them. He wanted to send them this letter of encouragement. Uh, give thanks in all things, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Wow. In fact, the, the theme of giving thanks to God comes up 102 times in the Old Testament, and when the actual phrase give thanks is like 72 times. And the definition of, of that phrase is the acknowledgement, acknowledging what is right about God in praise and thanksgiving. So I think it's a little more than just a suggestion, right? It was a, oh, you might want to just give thanks. I think it's sort of, I don't want to say command because I don't want to be legalistic, but I think for the benefit of our life, right? For the well-being of an abundant life, how much this attitude of gratitude can bless you. So amid this turmoil, I had to ask myself, I sat down, I thought, okay, let's take an assessment. What am I thankful for? I'm thankful for that during this time I had a chance to slow my crazy schedule down and to prioritize and learn for me the difference between the things that were urgent and the things that are important, right? Usually our lives are so consumed with urgent, urgent, urgent. This has to be done at this time and this has to be done at that time and I gotta do this and I gotta do that. Gotta, 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 gotta right? All the gottas. And it was such a nice chance to whew, take a breath, breathe and think about what's really important. I get to be with my family, right? Some of the other things that I noticed as I was able to catch up on some home and yard projects, man, my gardens never looked so good. I hope you all had a chance to see my house. It looked so awesome. Pete did stuff in our yard. We've been living there since 2000, and it looks gorgeous. I had time for hobbies, for reading, for piano, crocheting, cooking, gardening. I had time for those things, time that I didn't have before. One of my favorite things is I had lunch every day with that handsome dude right there, my son Luke, every day because his work forced him to work from home. And I get to have lunch and watch The Office with Luke <laughs> every day. And in the beginning, I had Lydia too. Wave your arm there, Lydia. I had you there. She is. I had her every day too when she was, had to work from home. She's back in her in her lab now, but um, it was so great. It was so great. I got Pete. It was so great. Other than the golf course and some work at Jeff's house, I had Pete a lot. <laughs> I had him a lot, and I absolutely loved it. I loved watching some Netflix series. I didn't even own Netflix till the COVID came. Didn't even have it. And um, boy, it's a whole new world, let me tell you. There's some good stuff on there. <laughs> um, and then uh, how about this? How about appreciating things that I so took for granted? Things like uh, shopping, right? Just going out shopping. Being able to go in whatever store you want to go in, whenever you want to go. How about live music? Concerts, right? How about going to plays? How about going to the movies? You know, be a bucket of popcorn and go in the movies? How about lunch with a friend? Or coffee, sitting over a cup of coffee, solving all the world's problems, right? I miss those things. I had coffee this morning with Pete, but there was only like four tables in there, right? And we were lucky to get one. If not, we would have had coffee in the car. So just some of those freedoms that have been taken away. How about uh, toilet paper? Never appreciated toilet paper so much in my life. <laughs> toilet paper, who would have thunk it? Hmm. And how about this, seeing people smile. Boy, do I miss that. I miss that. I miss going up to somebody at Starbucks and her smiling at me and me smiling at her as we say our greetings and stuff. I miss that. Pete and I always say the greatest joys in life are the little teeny things. 
That's the best stuff. It's the best stuff. So it's been a great year to refocus, and God, I'm thankful. And even with the election, I'll say it, I'm kind of thankful it turned out the way it did. I'd be afraid if it turned out any other way, we might be in ashes. So, I mean, we have to look at everything with this different lens, a lens of gratitude. What can I find in this to be thankful for? So now I want to take, this is the meat, okay? So I got like 15 minutes to give you some meat. You ready for some? This is part that I actually really love. I want to take it a step further, okay? So it's, I am so grateful for the, the grateful, for the bountiful, amazing blessings in my life, the tangibles, right? Like Pete, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine breathing air without him a part of it. He is my best friend. He makes me feel beautiful when I'm not. He makes me feel brave when I'm scared to death. He makes me feel like I'm it when I know I'm not. My kids, if I lived a thousand lifetimes perfect, I could never deserve them. Never deserve them. I've done more wrong with Luke and Lydia than I've ever done right, but God. But God. I am so grateful for my kids, my home, my beautiful home, 100-year-old house. So grateful for that. Even my old dog, he's blind and broken, but I love him. He's a goof. I'm like you, Trace, right? He's the best. <laughs> I love my family, my parents. I have great parents. I could have been, I could have had terrible parents. I have great parents. I'm so grateful for that. How about your friends? Wow. If friends were money, I would be the richest woman on the planet. I have the greatest friends anyone could ever ask for. Women I could go to at a drop of a hat, bear my soul to, know I'm safe, know they care. People I trust and love, what a blessing friends are. If you have friends, please don't ever take them for granted. How about this church? Oh my goodness, my spiritual walk has dramatically changed since I walked through those doors. A mess, broken, sitting next to Pete back there crying every, every Sunday. People must have thought, who's the new chick that just cries the whole time? Jeff said, come, not to give anything, just come and heal. Best words he could have ever said to me, so thank you, Jeff. Came and healed and grew. Have a whole different perspective of this wonderful person called God, right? Whole new perspective. He had a lifetime, we have, we have a caring crafters group and you get balls of yarn and sometimes they have what's called the alien when you're trying to unroll the yarn, this big thing comes out and it's all tangled up and it takes hours to unravel this yarn. That's what poor Pastor Jeff had to do with my heart and my spiritual heart. Unraveling all that took a long time and that was all the mess of religiosity and legalism and falsehoods about God that defined who he was in my heart from well-meaning people over the course of, a year of my lifetime. But watching that all come unraveled and getting this, I feel like a baby brand new Christian all the time and I love it. I don't ever wanna go back. How about that you live in the US? Wow, we could be somewhere like when we do ministry in India. You can't even say Jesus out loud or you'll be thrown in some kind of a prison, right? that we can come here and be free. How about your financial provision? How about your good health, right? Don't ever take it for granted, right? So many tangible blessings, but let, what about the intangible blessings? These aren't the things that necessarily you can see or physically touch. Um, they're more things that like you experience, I guess that's the word I wanna say. They're like, their experiences, sensations. These are things I'm telling you that you encounter every single day of your life that I bet you very rarely consider, consider your life without, or even consider giving thanks to God for. So let's go explore a couple of those. I'm gonna stretch your little imagination muscle. You ready for a little bit of exercise? Okay, let's go on this little imagination route. How about something intangible a sensation, how about the sensation? There's a, this is not a, uh, an exclusive list. There's tons, you can add your own, right? But I just picked a couple that I would like to share with you, five real quick. The first one is warmth, warmth. Something as simple as warmth. I think about where I'm gonna be in a week. I am gonna feel the warmth of the Florida sun <laughs> on my skin. I'm gonna kick off my shoes and I'm gonna put my 
feet into the hot sands of Siesta Key and feel that warmth. I'm gonna go in water that is crystal clear that you can see to the bottom and it feels like a bathtub. Warmth. How about warmth at a fire pit? One of my favorite things is going to Tracy and Dale's house and sitting outside with the best people under the planet in this beautiful glow of the fire pit and laughing and just having a great time. But it's so funny how a fire just draws you to it, right? Right, you feel the warmth. There's something so inviting about that and comforting about that. We burn on the farm and I love it. We call them, I love it, fire bugging. We love fire bugging where we just clean fence and burn everything. I've thrown more gloves in fires because you're picking up sticks and you throw it in and your glove goes, and whoop, there goes another pair. Whoop, there it is, right, another one. I love fire, something about the warmth of a fire. How about the warmth of a hot cocoa warming your hands after you've been outside in the snow all day, right, with sledding or skiing or whatever, ice skating, whatever you like to do in the winter, and you come in and you grab that cocoa, right, and you feel it through the cup, and then you take a sip, right, and don't you feel it? Like, go right down, and then you feel it go down your pipes and just spread. What an amazing sensation. Does anybody agree with me on that? Is that an amazing sensation? That's an amazing sensation. How about this? How about your morning shower? A nice warm shower. Most of the world has no idea what that even is. We get to get a warm, and we take it so for granted, right? Warmth, feeling that hot water just go on you. I love this, Pete one birthday gave me this. I thought it was a garbage can. I was like, wow, he's like, happy birthday. And I opened it and was not sure what it was. <laughs> It was a towel warmer. It's like this bucket you plug in and you put your towels and you come out and you wrap that warm towel around your body. Oh my glory. I thank God for that every, every shower. Oh, Father, this feels so good. So Pete, thank you. That was like one of the best gifts you could have ever bought me. I love my towel warmer. How about a hot tub? But think about this. God didn't have to make us have the sensation to feel warmth, did he? Right? You could live without it, right? You could. What was his purpose? I know there's some safety things of feeling temperatures and stuff, but what about that? Feeling the hot cocoa go down and warming yourself by a fire. God didn't have to make it. We could live without it. But he delights, I love this scripture that said, God delights in giving good things to his children. He did it so you would enjoy it. How about this, the next one, aromas. I'm gonna give this to you, Lonel, and I want you to, you all thought it was just for ambiance. <gasps> oh, one of them blew out. Well, Pete, you can relight it when it comes back to you. But you could pass this around. Oops, it all went out. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's a lighter in that bag right there. Lonel will pass that around, but how about, how about aromas? Think about aromas, all the different smells in the world. You know you have something called olfactory neurons, which are odor receptors in you and microscopic molecules are released by all the substances all around us all the time, whether it's coffee brewing, whether it's pine trees in the forest, whether it's a great candle of gingerbread, wait, do you smell how good that smells? And it stimulates those receptors that sends, they detect those molecules and send a message to your brain, which identifies the smell. That all in itself is nothing short of a miracle, right? Or think about that. Think about some of the things that you love to smell. Think about fall leaves. P and I went two, week, two weekends ago, we took a couple days and spent it in black waterfalls and walking through the woods. Something about the fall leaves, that nutty smell, right? It smells, the fall smells are just the best. And I know it's the smell of decay, but there's something about it. <laughs> But there's something so yummy about the smell of fall. How about rain on a hot summer day when it hits the street and it sends up that smell and you know that coolness is coming, right? There's something about that smell. How about a baby's head? Oh, if you're watching Christy, Damien's head. Oh my gosh, I hold him. Like, there's nothing like that smell. How about coffee? Who's a coffee hound? Oh, give me the smell of coffee, bacon. There you go, Pete, that one's for you. Garlic and onions, right? Garlic and onions, you could just eat a full meal. Somebody starts sauteing garlic and onions and you're hungry all over again. How about peppers and onions? That triggers something for me. My dad was a third generation auctioneer and we spent every weekend where my dad would be the auctioneer, him and his twin brother, hilarious. They were so much fun, it was like a show. But we would have the food truck that came and he would get there at like eight o'clock in the morning, first thing he'd do, start cooking peppers and onions for the sausages and stuff. Dang, 
Am I allowed to say that? Dang, it was so good. This triggers memories, right? How about pine trees? Like Christmas time, the smell of pine. And here's my favorite. How about hot baking bread? Oh, bread. Bread. What is it about bread? Pete's mom used to make eight loaves every single Saturday. They were gone by Tuesday. They were so good. You'd walk in her house to smell like bread. Jeff, right now, is so exploring making bread, and I love going over his house when he's cooked one because he cracks into that and we puts a big thing of butter out and we just or, or dipping oil and we just eat this amazing bread, but that smell, right? What if the smell wasn't there? Would it taste as good? Mm, not quite sure. So God didn't have to make aromas, right? He didn't have to. You could live without smelling, right? It'd be hard to not have something to put your glasses on if we didn't have a nose, but you could live without smelling, right? So why did he give it to us? Why did he give us this amazing gift of the ability to smell these aromas and everything everything could smell the same too, right? And it doesn't. It's amazing. It's amazing what God does because he delights in giving you good gifts. How about the next one, Pete? This one I'm gonna call on you for. How about flavors? right? You have taste buds all over your tongue. Do you know it's like this map, and each spot has a different taste that it tastes, but there it distinguishes between taste through detecting an interaction, this is interesting, with different molecules, again, molecules. So there's four, uh, five major, or six major tastes that are in your mouth, right? You have sweet, sour, or tart. You have salty. You have bitter. You have savory or spicy, and you even have metallic. So those are the six basic, but there's thousands beyond that, right? So those are all triggered by the molecule binding itself to this G-shaped protein and the receptor of the cell membranes of your taste buds. Is that so flippin' bizarre? We can't even, I don't even understand that. Do you even understand that? I don't know. I don't even know what that means. All I know is what a gift flavor is right? Think about all those different things. So I brought something. Pete, you can hand those out, and everybody can take one. Um, I made these little mini Dutch apple pies, and I'm going to tell you why. If I told you to eat a spoonful of sugar, anybody shout out. If I said, eat the spoonful of sugar, what would you say it tasted like? Sweet, Sweet right? If I said, here's a teaspoon of salt, what does it taste like? Salt. If I said, here's some cinnamon, eat that. What is it? It's kind of spicy, right? Here's some lemon rind. I want you to eat that lemon rind. What is that? Bitter, right? Sour. How about a Granny Smith tart apple, right? Tart. Tart apple. How about the salt and the caramel? So all those things are in this. And so when you put all these flavors together, you get to taste the sweet of the sugar. You get to taste the sour tartness of the apple. You get to taste the bitterness of the lemon rind. Go ahead, you can enjoy it. You don't have to wait for anything. The, there, you get to taste the saltiness of the salted caramel sauce that's on top. There's salt in that, right? I'm sorry, Vaughn, it's not gluten-free. I feel so bad. Um, thank God there's nothing metallic in there. So <laughs> I did leave the metal out. But isn't that amazing? Think about the gift of being able to taste flavor and the variety of flavors. What if everything tasted like sugar? Everything. You eat a piece of bacon, it tasted like sugar. You ate a piece of bread, it tasted like sugar. You ate whatever. No, oh, God is so amazing. He gave us so many flavors. Why? Can you live without tasting? Sure. But why would you wanna? <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke. But anyway, because God gives, he delights in giving good gifts to his children. This is a gift you use every single day. And do you ever take a moment like that one leper to say, thank you so much, God, for the ability to taste that, right? For the ability to smell that candle, right? How about colors? I'm down to my last two, and I love these two. Color. Color. I love color. I love color. I love anything. Usually, I, you know me. I usually wear bright, 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 but I thought I would be kind to you today and wear something subdued. But So here's how color works. When light hits an object, let's say there's a banana, 
and light hits the banana, that banana is going to absorb some of that light and it's going to bounce back some of that light. And the, the, which wavelengths are reflected or absorbed depends on the property of the object, whether it's glossy, whether it's not, whether. So the human eye and the brain together translate light into color. Go figure that out. Go figure that out. That is amazing when you think about it. Light receptors in the eye transmit a message to your brain which produces a familiar sensation of color. Objects appear different colors because they absorb some colors, wavelengths, and reflect or transmit other color wavelengths. And the colors that we see are the wavelengths that are reflected at us, while so white objects appear white because they reflect all the colors, and black objects appear black because they absorb all the wavelengths, right? So think about some of the colors. Think about fall. Huh, Pete, when we were in Black Waterfalls, holy cow, it was so beautiful walking in the woods and everything was gold. It was amazing. It was like the fall colors. Look at that. Look at that. He didn't have to do that. How about this? How about the ocean? How about Caribbean water? Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. He's so good. He's so good. How about this? A sunset. Right? I used to do color analysis and we were to teach people what color looks best on you. This color goes with that color. This color doesn't go with that color. And if I said, I want you to wear this purple and this brown and this turquoise, you'd be like, whoa. Hmm. <laughs> Nobody. Nobody paints like God. Nobody paints like you. You're so cool. Look at that painting. Leonardo da Vinci has nothing on God. <laughs> Seriously, I love Psalm 19. One says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. Is that that picture right there? That's the heavens declare the glory of God. God's glory, and then the Message Bible says it even cooler. It says, God's glory is on tour in the skies. God's craft is on exhibit across all horizons. Is that fabulous? That's your God. That's your God. It's not black and white. Show that one picture, Lydia, I have. Look at the difference, right? He didn't have to make color. He didn't have to. Everything could look like her on the left, right? You still see her. You could function quite well, right? But look, that's what God wants for you. You could live without color. Many people do. Sadly, there are some that are colorblind, right? So why? Why did he make all that crazy science in our eyes so that we could see things and see the colors? Because your God, your God, delights in giving you all of you, good things. He wants your life to be abundant. And I'm going to go to one of my favorite things. I was going to do sound, but I took it a step further. You know what I love, music. So with that, I'm going to ask just Tony and Luke and Amy. You hear him? You hear him? Come on down. I'm going to just, just show you something real cool about music. Okay, so let's talk about music for a second. Sound waves are created from vibrations of molecules. Here we go back to those molecules again, right? Things that we can't see. Come on up, guys. I need you. And you can go right to your spot. So I'm going to call these guys up, and I'm going to sort of put them on the spot. So, Dean, if you can make sure everything is on for me, that would be awesome. Okay, you're going to need this, Amy. I'm going to do something. They have no idea. So... Bear with them. No judgment, right? No judgment. This is no judgment zone. Okay. That's for you. It's not going to be rough, I promise you. All right. So, music. Oh, what a gift music is. So, here's what I want you to do. So, Tony, I want Tony. No, you don't need it. You don't need it. You don't even probably know it. So, this is, this is something they, don't, they probably don't, n none of them know. Okay. So, Tony. I'm going to have you play a drum beat four count, downbeat on the one and three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, hear that? Lydia, show us a sound wave of a drum up there. That's what the sound wave of a drum is. Thank you, Tony. Okay, Lukey, I want you to play the bass line I've played in front of you. Same four count. <laughs> 
sorry about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's so funny. Okay, so you see it? Good sight reading. Good. And there's the bass. Look at that. That's the sound waves that Lukey just made. Amy, I'm going to ask you to play the same thing. D, D. You got the music there. Go ahead. And you just strum it to the fork. Lydia, if you could show hers, look at that. Yeah, look at that. That's what you just did, Aim. See what she did? She made those sounds, right? Now I'm gonna do the keyboard. Right? Is there a keyboard? Did I not do? I didn't do keyboard. Sorry about that. Shucks. That would have been cool. I goofed up. So and then, so now if we all played that together. And I'll just sing with it. We're ready, guys? One, two, three, and. That's all I needed for you. Did so great. You did so great. Let's talk about putting them on the spot. But listen, do you see what that is? Here's a sound wave. Here's a sound wave. There's a sound wave. There's a sound wave, right? What I love about music is each one of those things makes a separate and unique sound that your body picks up it as a different way. But when we put it together, something brand new happens. Brand new. That song you just heard, right? Even though it's like super old. But you know what I mean by brand new. That didn't even exist when Luke was playing the bass by himself. It didn't exist when Tony was playing the drums by himself or me playing the keys or Amy playing the guitar, right? But that's this brand new thing happens, like what the band did with the three songs this morning, which was so awesome. They can't do it by themselves. That's my favorite part of music. Sure, you can do a drum solo, a bass solo, a vocal solo, keyboard solo, guitar solo. You could do all that, right? But when you put it together, isn't that amazing? God didn't have to make music, right? You could live without music. Tracy, you and I would have a very hard time with that. He didn't have to, right? But he did. Why? Again, your God delights in giving good things to his children. Karen gave me this bracelet, my dear friend, and I love this bracelet. It says, when words fail, music speaks. Isn't that the truth? Sometimes we just need music as this place to run into. I know that's my place. That's my actual, you know, that old term prayer closet. That's what it is for me. I'll go in my car and drive and put music on. I'll go to my piano, turn on the light. Sometimes I'm the only one on the house and the light is the only light on in the house, and I'll sit there and play, and it takes me someplace. I'm able to communicate a different way. All these things are intangibles. They're not necessary for living, but boy, they add a whole new dimension to your life, don't they? The ability to smell, to taste, to see color, to feel warmth, to hear music, right? I bet God's like a parent at Christmas time, right? When you give a gift, I don't know about you, I know Pam, you've got to be this way. When you give your kids a gift, what are you doing? Come on, open it, open it, open it, open it, open it. I imagine when God's painting that sunset, he's like, come on, oh, wait do you see this. Wait do you see this, right? When he's letting that water boil to make hot cocoa, I bet he's going, oh, 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 oh. wait do you do that. Wait do you smell the bread Jeff just baked. Wait do you smell this. I bet he's like that. He's probably like, hurry, open it, open it. I bet he's just like that. But the most important thing I want you to take away from today is one thing. Giving thanks in all things helps us practice one thing that's vital to our walk with God, and that's practicing his existence, his presence, right? He is. 
He says, I am that I am. There's a quote that says, how desolate the life of the one who has a heart full of gratitude and no one to give it to. Somewhere inside each and every one of us, when we're thankful for whatever it is we're thankful for, we know that there's somebody responsible for giving us whatever that thing is that's inciting our gratitude. It makes you realize God is. Romans 1.20 says, Since the earliest times, men have seen the earth and the sky and all God made and know of his existence and his great power so that they will have no excuse when they stand before God saying they didn't believe. Wow. Right? Everything's all around you showing he is. He is. So give thanks in all circumstances. Practice his presence every day by doing that. Practice his existence. And you know what your byproduct is? Happiness, because it's hard to be angry when your heart's grateful. Joy, because it's hard to be sad when you're super thankful. Peace, because it's hard to be afraid when you're thankful. And love, it's hard to hate when you're thankful. So Colossians, I loved our, our teachings in Colossians that Jeff did. 3.16 says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. I don't know about you, but I think about the triumphal entry a lot. I think about when Jesus was coming, I remember when they were throwing the palms and it was a giant parade and the Pharisees said, Jesus, shut these people up. They're making way too much noise. And what did he say? I love what he said. He said, I cannot shut them up because if I did, the rocks themselves would cry out. So my prayer in my life is that I don't want to miss any of the little things to be grateful for in my life and I really pray to God that no rock will ever have to cry out in my place. So that's it, thank you so much. I was gonna sing a song, but it's late, and um, I already went over by 10 minutes, so Michelle, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, but thank you for hearing my, my attitude of gratitude, and I hope that you think about it today, that as you taste something for breakfast, as you smell something, as you go outside, and even though it's raining, Right? Feel the warmth even of the heat of your car when it's cold outside. Don't you love to get in your car and crank the heat on high? Right? The colors this time of year, I know they're a little dull, but they're even beautiful in that. Right? So just think about those things and realize God's saying, I am, I am, I am. Thanks for hearing me. So with that, let's just pray. Aw, oh, stop. <laughs> you make me cry. Father, we thank you for so much, so much more than we often express. And I pray, God, that you will open up our hearts to see you, to be like David, bold enough to scream your goodness even in our underwear, to be thankful for the things that we take way too for granted. God, you're an amazing God, and like I always say, you're so cool. I just love you so much, and pray a attitude of gratitude over all my friends now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thanks everybody. Have a great week.